Okay, everybody, welcome to Quiet Before. I have an incredible panel for you, and I just wanted to begin with introductions. So myself, you can call me Allie, you can call me Amazing Allie if you're feeling spicy. I am the writer-director of a film called Ulam Main Dish, and I also co-wrote a cookbook called Amboy Recipes from the Filipino-American Dream. I'm Lagaya Mashan. I write about food for the New York Times, and I'm the co-author with the chef Angela Dimayoga of Cookbook Filipinex. My name is Angela, also known as Angel Dimayuga, and I'm a chef and a culinary artist and a cultural producer. I've lived in New York for 15 or 17 years, and I just relocated back to California. I work a lot with food, but I uh, work a lot with artists these days making ephemeral projects for social praxis. Hi, my name is Nicole Panseca. I had the pleasure of uh, working with Ali Cuerdo on her feature documentary called Ulam. Also, I'm such a fan of Lagaya and Angela for having been in the restaurant and food scene in New York. I came to New York in 1998, which started my journey with Filipino food, discovering that we had very little representation. So since uh, 1998, even up until now, I'm continuing to discover and learn the food ways, the history, the culture from my parents' homeland. Currently, I split time between Miami in Manhattan, where I do talks on DEI and promote and talk about my book, I Am a Filipino, and continue different food businesses. I'm happy to be here. I feel like everyone here is an author, which is pretty cool. It's pretty fascinating to have four representations, I would say, of Filipino food right now. So I have to ask, what is one thing that excites you about Filipino food right now? I'm just excited how much of it is out there. And I mean, we're talking diaspora here. We're speaking to um, Filipino food here in New York, but also in countries around the world outside of the Philippines. I just went to a Filipino restaurant in Paris that was packed full of non-Filipinos. Was it Reina? Was it Reina? Yes, yes it was. <laughs> it's so exciting to just see so many places and making really different kinds of dishes. There's no way we could even exhaust the dishes that exist in the Philippines, right? There are so many dishes that have just never even made it to our shores here in America. But seeing that greater range, seeing people taking Filipino flavors and adapting them to their, their life in other lands and coming up with something completely new, that's all very exciting to me. My experience has been growing up in the Bay Area, being around a ton of Filipinos, finding my way in New York, in the just general Filipino community, and then looking up to people like Nicole, who was just doing it and reminding me of back home. And where I am now is kind of bopping around and exploring what it means to be so Filipino around the world, too. I recently got to do an event celebrating the work of an amazing contemporary artist, Stephanie Comilong, who's based in Berlin. And she had a big celebration for a solo show she was doing for the Arco Art Fair in Madrid. And I got to help put together this huge huge celebration for her at a theater called Teatro Magno, which is a really beautiful old theater and do a full Filipino pista like takeover and just see what it meant to bring out Spanish people, you know, the complications of like being there for the first time, knowing that this is the land of our colonizers, but seeing there's so much interest in Filipino cuisine because it's still opening up to just a general audience. And what was so beautiful is uh, to see local Madrid Filipinos come out as well because the founder of it's called TBA 21 that brought us out his manager of course of his whole home is a Filipina in her 60s I got to meet her by having a dinner at their house the night before that she sort of ran and then she brought 30 of her friends to the party and friends from the Filipino embassy because she organizes her own Philip philanthropic project of celebrating Filipino folk dance and organizing these shows and that money and proceeds goes to Filipino schools or just schools in the Philippines to encourage children to attend schools because they're offering free lunch that they're supporting. So to see that underbelly 
too of like the people that I wouldn't normally get to meet but because Stephanie and I are celebrating our heritage around the world and in, through and through in our practice get to meet the people that I wouldn't get to meet if I got to travel abroad for work and we were able to bring in a local Filipino cover band from Madrid they're the only one and help put together their biggest show yet and so getting to experience the diaspora where I couldn't have imagined meeting these people years and years ago in my practice, it makes me feel really aligned with what I'm doing and what we're all doing here. All right, Nick, I got to ask you, what are you excited about with Filipino food right now? I'd like to at least put things into perspective first and understand through what lens I'm looking at it. There are three lenses that I'm looking at Filipino food right now in no particular order. That being an entrepreneur, that being a cook, I don't even like to call myself a chef, but as a cook and uh, as a Filipino. Through these three lenses, I'd like to put into context what is happening through Filipino food, with Filipino food, and what I'm excited about. The context is that Filipino food in America, and if, if America is somehow symbolic of food trends globally, Filipino food only makes one less than 1% of all restaurants in the United States. There's a, a research company called Pew, P-E-W, and they released this statistic last year. Less than 1%. Now, if you were to look on your algorithm, it's just, I don't know, Angela's, Lagaya's, and mine, I'm going to guess that what is fed back to us is this explosive growth of Filipino food in the US, right? But when you look at the numbers, numbers don't lie. And so as an entrepreneur, what I am concerned about is how do we grow and keep sustainability and build the infrastructure for these entrepreneurs so that they can su succeed past the death year of year one and then succeed as a sophomore into year two and so forth. And I'm not convinced yet that where we can succeed. But that's also exciting for me that we can test the waters. Now, most food, I think, in America, when it comes from Mexico or Italy, even Thai food usually has a digestion period. And I think food typically comes through from an academic lens, introduction, education, absorption, and integration. Despite Filipinos being the second largest Asian group, despite us speaking English back home, despite our colonization, Despite so many factors, we're still almost really in the introduction stage. And that leapfrogs where other food has been able to integrate those four stages into American culture and the American kitchen table. Why this is exciting to me is one, I can have it through the lens as an outsider and, and observe this, observe the different players, observe the the reception of Filipino food, and also what I can do as an entrepreneur, as well as an advocate behind the scenes to help assist, or at least have these kind of conversations to dissect the success. What I am conscious of is by whose definition can Filipino food be looked upon as successful or uh, accepted? And I, I want to be conscious always of how these new interpretations, as well as classic foods, are interpreted and accepted and lauded in American culture and by and by who. So it's an exciting time to know that we are in the midst of it right now. We're not looking at this 20 years from now. We're not looking at it in the 1990s or early aughts. We're actually in the midst. And through these kind of conversations with Nancy and Quiet Before and journalistic pieces like Lagaya and artistic pieces through Angela, what we're doing is creating a narrative that's really rich. We don't, we've never seen it like this before. And we might be the food culture that frogs those stages remains to be seen. And no other time have we had this social, political, and culinary landscape that we can leapfrog, that there's an audience that's interested in doing. It. It's really dope. It is dope. I'm like fired up listening to you. I, I love what you were talking about when you were talking about the four stages of really getting a food and a culture out into America. I would love to kind of discuss that a little bit more. So I, I hear what you're saying when we're in the introduction phase. I, I agree with you. I wonder how we can get to the education phase. I wonder if some of us are already engaging in that. I'm curious, you know, to hear from, from all of you. Lagai, I'm also curious to hear from you because I think that 
in, you know, from a journalism perspective, there is a certain amount of education. And I know in your writing, you really do take a historical look at some of these dishes. So I'm curious, you know, how, how, how do we leapfrog? How do we move from that introduction to education and beyond? It's a tricky thing because there's also the sense that, so it's very generous to educate. It's also response, is it a responsibility? Is it something we need to do? I think there's a tension there about, do we need to be constantly explaining ourselves to out outsiders? I think that the, the generous stance is to say, come in and learn about this and to want to share. That's anybody who's in the world of food wants to share what they have, but sometimes it can be disheartening to always have to explain. So I, I think about these two different sides of that equation. And the truth is, Filipino food has been around in the United States for in the world. I think about, you know, back in the 70s, Nora Daza, right, on the left bank of Paris, people were flocking, celebrities were coming to taste Filipino food in Paris in the 1970s. Here we are, it's half a century later. Why, why is it still something that's that's on the margins. We have this incredible community of Filipino restaurants out in Queens here in New York City, but that was always seen as Filipino food for Filipinos. Same thing in the East Village. Then you had um, King Fajana Kong's place, Kuma Inn, open in, I think in 2003. So that was sort of the first time, but I think of that as this moment of crossover uh, when suddenly people could be introduced to Filipino food in a setting that wasn't predominantly geared towards Filipinos. I mean, I'm curious, Nicole, do you do you remember that you were in New York when King opened um, Kumayan? What was it like for you to, to go there for the first time? Thanks for bringing up uh, Chef King. You know, we, um, we want to give blessings to his family for his passing in 2023, I believe. And I think kudos to Quiet Before and this position to kind of reflect back and so we don't forget. So thanks for bringing his name up. When he opened, the Lower East Side was an amazing place. It still is. But at the time, there was still a sense of curiosity, unchartered territory for food. There, there were some smatterings of restaurants, certainly bars. And so to be on in this territory that was exploratory, daring, you know, you had Wiley Dufresne, with Clinton uh, 77 as well, not too far away. It was developing a brand, a position that you could try new foods. I just remember going up those stairs and smelling vinegar and soy sauce and patis. And to your point, not having to over explain. And I had brought all my friends from Saatchi from my advertising days. And I was just psyched that we could use a corporate card and to support a business like that and not have to go to the Asia de Cuba's at the time. But when I took a bite of his, I believe, adobo ribs and how toothsome and savory and loud, not muted, I felt seen. Your posture changes a little bit. I'll never forget that experience. It was a seminal moment, as was Romy and Amy at Cendrillon. All the places, Cristal's, uh, Manila Garden. It was about just being seen. You know, I remember on that note when I was in fifth grade and I would look at U.S. history textbooks and there would just be a paragraph on the Philippine War, the Spanish War, and just to see the Philippines listed in text, I would pour over that page. Just seeing Philippines in text was so monumental to me. Those are the memories and feelings that I recall when you bring up Chef King and his unique way of merging his background as Thai and Filipino is just a very special time and one of those very influential. How was it for you to come into the Lower East Side with your first restaurant, Maharlika? Uh, I remember we talked about it a little bit in Ulam and to me that's the that's the Cinderella story. I would love for you to talk a little bit about what that was like to land in the East Village with such a loud, sure voice for Filipino food. Thank you. It was a long time coming. It was since 1998 that I started a double life of working in advertising and then moonlighting is what we used to call it as a hustler, um, dishwasher, bartender to learn the trade. And I was the East Village girl. I lived on second and A. It wasn't yet as gentrified and I had trepidation at times, but I knew that part of town. 
like the back of my hand. It was always a group effort. I remember my boyfriend at the time said, that's going to be your place. And I said, what place? And he said, Leon, on 12, I was like, they ain't never going to give it up. A decade more later, I went to the space and I said, can I use your place on a Saturday and Sunday for brunch? And he said, what is it, Filipino brunch? It was a French place. It was what we now call a pop-up. And then I was hanging out at Five Nine with Zach uh, Palaccio and the crew at the time. And they said, what are you going to call it? And I said, I don't know. But it's, oh. Some said, well, what might the Philippines be called before it was called the Philippines and named after King Philip of Spain? And some theorists would suggest the original name was Maharlika. So that's where we got that name. But what I found most interesting, I go to the printer and there was no Kinko's there. There wasn't like a corner shop to get things printed on Canva. I went to a printer right behind Bryant Park and I went to get my first business cards printed. And a young kid was at the desk and he said, the owner wants to talk to you. I said, oh man, I'm always getting in trouble. <laughs> you know, like why the owner wants to talk to me? Like, like school again, the principal, the owner comes to me and says, are you Maharlika? And I said, yes. And he was like, why did you name it Maharlika? And I said, oh, blah, blah, blah. I told him the story. And lo and behold, he pulls out a drawer and it's all Maharlika business cards, matchsticks. There was a restaurant at the New York consulate and it was called Maharlika. And from those in the know back in the day, people said they would dress up, they had music. It was a very fine dining Filipino restaurant. There were so many signs of green lights along the way. I know Lagaya is not going to accept this and may refute it, but her review in the New York Times, I did not read. Everyone in my staff read. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to read. I'm not going to read it. And then like, you got to read it. And then I was like, okay. And I read it. And I I was in tears to see it. And that was more like. Oh, I'm yeah, crying. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. I know. You know? Truly, truly one of my favorite Filipino restaurants of all time, Maharlika. You um, that was actually the first restaurant I went to after I talked to the cinematographer Matty Libatike about my idea to do a um, Filipino food documentary. And he said, well, you've got to start with Maharlika. Oh, shit. <laughs> Damn. It's so many memories, so many people that came through. And it was such a great cross section of discerning Titas, very exuberant Gen Zers, Gen Xers, rather, who also were inspired to hear Biggie eat spam, look at bones, oxtail bones, and completely be ourselves. I always said, this is our party. Everyone's invited, but it's our house rules. And the Gaia's uh, review was instrumental in elevating it to a point of critical concern, critical review, just by association, you know? So it, it's, a, it's a big deal. So what I'm hearing from this, Legaya, is that you have played quite a hand in elevating, I would say, the voices, some of which are here. I know, Angel, you had talked to me a few years ago about how your spread in the New York Times really changed things. And so I'm curious to hear for you what that experience was like. The opportunity to do it um, felt like it came out of nowhere a bit. I think that just showed that there's just this interest in our voices, Filipinos and our cuisine. I felt really lucky because I wasn't officially cooking Filipino food publicly. Earlier, Lagaya mentioned how education is really generous. And I think Filipinos are generous. I think in our culture, that's how we're known and that's how our grandmas are and our moms. And then to get a chance to share my home cuisine, because that's what I could reference in an article, the comments, what I think my favorite part about it coming out is the 10 recipes are all these folks that shared their memories of eating Filipino food wherever they grew up, or if they had a Filipino nanny that um, made them a dish and they didn't know the name of it. Our version of sharing is so intimate. The type of connection that happened after that was really overwhelming and really fun. I hadn't been in such a big Filipino community since I was in high school. It's really fun 
funny because for many years, I sort of forgot about it, but I was the president of our Filipino club um, in high school. I went to an all girls private Catholic high school, 500 girls, and the Filipino club was the most powerful club simply because it was the most social club because we had to practice for PCN, folk dancing, et cetera. And so that version was even, you know, being a part of PCN and our Filipino student union, that's also generous for us to share our folk dancing and our ideas about family and food because we'd all have practice at each other's houses. So that was an opportunity to jump right back in into having a huge Filipino community. And wasn't um, your mom also a traditional folk dancer? Yeah, she was a folk dancer. And so preserving- she traveled around the world? Yeah. Yeah, she was in Bayanihan, which is the national dance troupe, Filipino dance troupe. There was something embedded in that. What we're talking about here in this virtual room is this calling. There's almost a manifestation that happens. There's uh, a connection to our like multi-generational experiences, and then they just kind of pop out by existing, even in small ways when we were you were talking, you were asking us about education and how Ligaya also mentioned how it's a big responsibility. I'm doing it in really tiny ways too, like teaching my partner Filipino words so I can remember them because I'm not around my family enough or really small, funny things like teaching her muta, like eye boogers, like when, when we're looking at my dog and being like, trying to clean them up. And it's really for me to preserve those memories of the education that I was taught about our culture. And I feel like I'm just trying to splash back into that too. So like even signing our note, I was trying to remember, I'm like, what's tomorrow? Sabukas. Like when I, when I emailed you guys, I just want to try to remember myself because I think that's what I yearn for the most. And then meet people like all of us here in this room and continue to, even in my process of uh, trying to remember certain words that my mom said at home. Um, I remembered a really funny one when my sister was about to go out to the club and she was living with my mom. I remember she'd always tease her and like say she was wearing something sexy and revealing. She'd be like, your Kalulu Wai showing. And I never knew what that meant. I knew that it meant something like you're, you're dressing pretty risque and I don't like it. But when I looked up the word, finally, and never thought to look it up, I realized it meant soul. And I was like, whoa, that's so intense. That's an intense thing to say, like your soul is showing. And then that led us on a internet search of certain words like that, that relate to Filipino shamans and babaylan and all these things that I didn't know that um, I still, you know, I'm, I'm still intimidated to learn about, about like, Filipino spirituality, et cetera. And then she found for me the next day through friends, she has a friend that's an activist and uh, is dating someone that uh, is also an activist, but is coming to LA frequently to go to a Filipino school about shamanism. It's led by a teacher named uh, Virgil Apostol Mayer. And I've heard his name because I have this Filipino spirituality book that I'm too afraid to open up. I have had it for years. But I saw like some images of blood and things. And there's obviously a lot of other beautiful information, but I was like, I'm not ready for this. I think I'm just waiting for a teacher, basically. I found out that he's teaching in a school outside of LA. I'm like, this is so exciting. And I think for me, that's what I'm looking for is teachers and ways for me to hold information and um, experience them, socialize them, because that's the only way that I know how to do it. And that's why I cook. And that's why I do these like fun parties that range from Filipino grandma cuisine to this conceptual food that I like to make referencing my own experience, but all these cultures of food that I really love. I can only do my own version of sharing through learning myself and picking up what I am interested in and then sharing that just because that feels the most truthful while my quest as a diasporic Filipino is it's a journey and it's a quest and I don't have that direct connection to you know growing up in the Philippines and so uh, it's a lifelong journey and so I'm just really happy about all of the work that we do here for Nancy's work as well and as we're learning y'all want to be teachers for us and that's how we all all the Filipinos that 
we meet in the U.S., around the world, we all want to teach each other our own experience and what we're curious about. I especially loved a part where you said that learning and education is the process of remembering yourself. It reminded me, you know, all these individual words that we learn and relearn throughout our lives from the Filipino diaspora. It made me think of this, I think it was a chalkboard in the back of Maharlika that had a Filipino word of the day. I thought it was so interesting because there's a really simple way to educate one word a day, you know, and it made me think, okay, so if learning is the process of remembering, if education is the process of remembering who we are, can all of us share a Filipino food memory, a Filipino cultural memory that helped us remember who we are? First, I, I want to piggyback what Angel was talking about education and what Lagaya was talking about the responsibility Firstly, I just want to say that you're under no obligation if you choose to cook or open a Filipino restaurant to educate. But I do think that given where we're at in this current place and time, if you choose to, you might do so with the knowledge that you have influence on how we are characterized, how we are looked at, how are we enjoyed. And so again, you don't have to, if anyone's out there watching and curious how they may start their culinary Filipino journey, it's not a requirement. But if you choose to know that you get to introduce so many people, Filipino or not, to the culture via food. You asked what is our most I guess, quintessential Filipino food memory. I have two. The first one is running around the house and everyone was playing mahjong and there was music blasting. This is in San Diego where I grew up. You know, you run around, you run around, you run around. You take a breath by your parents when kids used to run around and get smelly and sunny and in the dirt. And uh, you make a pit stop literally like Formula One. You make a pit stop by your parents and they give you um, hand-to-mouth feeding. And so they you, they would feed you and you get to enjoy chicken adobo or gare gare. And then you can go around, around, around again. You come back to Formula One. But I remember I said, dad, what's that? I revert to an accent when I'm younger. And he was like, oh, that's bagoong. You know, it's the bright pink one, alamang. And my mom said, hindi na, don't feed her that. She's too young. She's not going to like it. And my dad said, no, no, no. She is a Filipino. She is going to like it. And sure enough, he put it with the oxtail, little peanut butter and kanin and fed it. And I could sense they're watching me, you know, while they're mid mahjong. And then mm, my eyes and they're like, oh, gunan ba? She likes it. See, that was one memory. But the second memory, which is probably the most Precious. I was in dance, middle school, 13, and uh, I had three girls with me, white girls. We all want McDo. We want McDonald's. Dad, 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 can you take us to McDonald's, please? And he said, of course. So we go, we, we don't do drive through. We go in the parking lot. We get our stuff. We come back. Oh, happy clams, huh? We have our happy meal in the car. And then I look at my dad. I get in the front seat. I look at my dad and in the corner of his eye, I see tearing. And at this point, he gets tight with me. I can feel it. Like he's, I feel tension. I, I, I looks hurt. Something's wrong. So the day goes by I'm with my friends. We're playing. My mom comes home and she said, we need to talk. I said, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with dad. He's so upset with me. I don't know what, what's going on. I spoke to my dad and I said, what's wrong? And he's like, you know, Nikki, we want you to be Filipino. We don't ever, ever want you to forget that you are Pinoy. Okay, so what did I do wrong? And he said, when you went to McDonald's, you went, all of your friends went, you came back, you did not ask, did I want anything? You did not ask if I was hungry. Don't you ever forget to ask everyone if they are hungry. And that was my first hospitality rule. That is my fondest Filipino food. Memory. I love that story, Nicole. Thanks for sharing that. These stories that we have around being Filipino American are so specific. The food memories I have, I wanted to talk about a formative uh, dish that Lagaya knows about my uh, grandmother's chicken really, you know? But right when you mentioned, you're right when you asked us that question, I also just thought of a recent one here. I, I only I only ate out once at uh, in LA because I've just been holed up uh, with uh, dealing with my transition here. 
But I finally went to La Cita. It was just so fun to meet Chef Chase with his new expanded menu and so happy to see their longevity and their evolution. I was just laughing at something he said. I don't know, Nicole's story and then what I'll share about McDonald's is there's just this complicated experience that we have of being Filipinos in diaspora. For example, I chuckled because when I met Chase, every dish was just so amazingly delicious. And I could just see through his cooking, his references as well, and what cuisine he's interested in. I think that's the experience we have when we dine out. We're like, okay, this is your version of this dish. And I could tell what kind of cuisines you like or what you're interested in. It's such a snapshot, like by autobiographical or biograph. It's like vulnerable in a way. The day before I was having a really LA moment, puzzling with doing a game night, everyone stays at home. And we were chatting about what our newest smoothie recipes are, because smoothies are actually hard. And so I have this newest one that I really like that for me feels really chefy. It's blueberries, bananas, and hazelnuts and all these other things. But the hazelnuts to me really make it more interesting because it tastes like you're making hazelnut milk in the Vita Bullet. And when I explained my newest smoothie recipe to all these like LA people, they were like, wow, sounds so French. And I was like, thank you as a joke. Like that's the superior cuisine or something. It was just me being funny. And when uh, I had Chase's food, he's famous for this chicken rotisserie that he does. And he cooks it in so many ways before he serves it, grills it, grills it, rotisseries it. And then it's served and it's super crispy and really umami. And when I ate the chicken and a couple of his other dishes that had very like French sauces, I was like, Chase, tastes so French. And he said, thank you. And in the same exact way that I did it. So there's a knowing. And I think like this is our experience. We're like going back to McDonald's. For me, I grew up eating tons of McDonald's because my dad worked at McDonald's for a really long time maybe 20 years before he retired. And only when I became a chef, realized this old family story that I never really thought about. The genius of my dad, something that existed in my family the whole time that I just never, I never recognized it as massive. My dad worked in McDonald's in the 90s when fa uh, fast food was explosive. It was everywhere. No one thought about it really as junk food, but like even luxury. And his branch in San Jose was competing with this LA branch. So they were super competitive and it was almost like a fun game for him where he'd call in to check in with sales every day and try to beat them. And one savvy um, experiment he had was to sneakily acquire these images from his Coca-Cola rep of a burger, fries, Coke, McChicken, fries, Coke, et cetera, and make them into a light board so that people can order set meals for the first time in fast food history in the U.S. to sell as many dishes or sell, sell as much um, food as possible during their lunch rush. He invented the set meal and he invented uh, essentially the extra value meal. The U.S. regional VPs grabbed onto it, created the extra value meal. And I just didn't know that happened in my own roof. And, you know, the same branch that I would go to as a kid, because when my dad was babysitting, I would just hang out at McDonald's. <laughs> And so our experiences are so, they're so integrated with other cultures. And I think that what we're doing here is trying to celebrate what we do and talk about the importance of our own qualities, generosity, or the way Nicole was talking about generosity in the form of like, just make sure everyone's okay and everyone's comfortable and that everyone's fed. It's really transcendent. So I, I just, I just feel like that's a role that we've chosen to take because that's being Filipino. It's so interesting. The idea that being Filipino can come out in any cuisine, in any experience. Um, and I'm curious, Ligaya, because I know you grew up, I think you told me a while ago with parents that cooked sort of, it was a little bit of like a, a different relationship with Filipino food growing up. So I'm curious, what food memories did you have? Are there any that stood out that really kind of made you light up and think, oh, I'm Filipino. So I'm only half Filipino. My mother's from the Philippines, my father's from England. And when my mother came to the United States, so this is as she tells the story, right? She had her master's degree. She was so well educated, she couldn't even make a pot of rice. My dad was the cook. You know, he was an Englishman, so he made curry, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and he learned to make adobo, but adobo was really the only Filipino dish we ate with any regularity. 
Um, and we didn't have these big family. Well, my mother's my mother's family was back in the Philippines, so I didn't have this experience that seems to be this essential experience, this essential food experience of Filipinos is the, these gigantic meals where everybody comes over and makes food for days. Uh, so I really did not learn Filipino food. And in a sense, I, I didn't really learn my myself as a Filipino until I came to New York and I started writing about food. And I have to say, I really have to give credit to my editor, a white guy who has a Filipino wife, and he said, you should go to this restaurant, you should write about this restaurant, Angeline's in Woodside. And I still remember going to Angeline's and they brought out crispy pata with the knife in. <laughs> I just thought, this is amazing. So that is my first big memory of Filipino food in this larger sense. So I, I didn't even know such things existed. I loved the Excalibur out of the stone aspect of it. I love that there was poetry and also magnificence. It was regal. It was, and at the same time, humble, right? This is a pig's foot. So I started going to all of these Filipino restaurants and really learning the food. But my other big early Filipino memory is, um, was interviewing Nicole Fonseca. I was writing a column at the time that was about people's favorite tools in the kitchen. And she chose banana leaves. And um, we had not actually met before, and uh, I just knew knew her um, because of the restaurant. And I, I, I came to her home just thinking, we're just going to have an interview. We're just going to chat. And she had cooked, and there was bibinka in banana leaves with salted duck egg. And I'd never had it that way before. I just had Western friendly, just regular old bibinka as a, as a cake, just to have this salty, salty, sweet wonder in front of me. Um, that was amazing. And also, again, the generosity that Nicole didn't just say, we're just going to chat. She's like, I'm going to show you, I'm going to give this to you. And you see, you didn't know, but you were giving me something completely, completely new. I feel very lucky that through the restaurants in New York City, and then through the Filipinos I've met in New York, and then with Angela and writing this cookbook. I'm so honored to have been your partner in this. And even though it was in the pandemic and we were communi <laughs> communicating entirely by the phone and by Zoom, it was such a beautiful time. It brought me so much closer to my mom. I was constantly texting her to say, what do you know about these dishes? And I was texting all of my friends. I know all of these poets and writers and, and artists and filmmakers in New York whom, whom I know and I see as part of this Filipino salon and we'd have these long email threads of, you know, what are your stories behind these dishes? And uh, that was that was just a really beautiful experience for me in getting to know myself through this food. Look at all of us teaching each other. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's beautiful to hear actually how, you know, we were saying you never know who you can reach and who you will touch with your food and with your education. And it seems like this is happening even in this room, which is really beautiful. Going back to Quiet Before and, and this idea of this expansive conversation, something that we want to talk about now is how Filipino food has maybe impacted culture and other art forms, specifically in New York. I think that it's interesting. A lot, a lot of this is we're saying is like to be Filipino is so many things, but it seems like generosity is a big part of it. Sharing is a big part of it. There's also, a, I would say, a, a loudness and a proudness to being Filipino. I'm curious if you've seen Filipino food and Filipino culture kind of mixing and blending with other parts of New York. I know everybody here has lived in New York for some time. Cooking in general has brought me to a place where I can meet all kinds of people. Getting to go to Jeepney, this one night that was organized by a non-Filipino, Christine Tran, who started Disc Woman, a DJ agency, was the one to say that we should gather the Filipinos in Jeepney. And that's how I met Gina. And, you know, Gina was like the poster child, like that night, especially. She had a Gina Rossier drink. She had herself, her like Playboy spread on the walls. And I got to meet Slayers that night, a bunch of other people. That type of gathering just really brings connection. And Gina is a person that's taught me so much about the trans Filipina experience. Her experience as a trans Filipina in pageantry and things like I, I got, I've gotten to learn about trans pageantry 
and its history and these stories that she wants to tell through food it started with food fine artists that I I feel like I would totally be out of my league to meet because I just respect their work so much I've gotten to connect to through food Paul Pfeiffer I feel like is one of the most well-known Filipino fine artists and I got to cook for him recently his work is very Filipino in ways and I got to see his solo show here in LA through that connection of getting to cook for him where he did these I'm sure we've all seen this in Catholic churches the gorgeous ornate wooden sculptures of Jesus on a crucifix that's usually in the front of these churches and he made these uh, sculptures just like this utilizing the um, skills of the famous uh, Filipino carvers that do this specific type of sculpture in the Philippines. You got to meet them. I got to ask him about all that. Like, this is culture that I would not know about that, of course, I think about a lot. I, I went to the most traditional Catholic kindergarten in the, or Catholic school it was a Catholic church. It's the most traditional conservative in the, in um, Northern California. And so I would, as a child, as a five-year-old stare at these images and pray to these images. And he did one carving, uh, showcasing our obsession of celebrity culture and did a carving of Justin Bieber in this same setting. And so I got to learn about this again through food, through Paul. And then, you know, I can talk about Filipino food with these people that have grown to become really good friends in my community and talk about Filipino words we want to remember, as I mentioned earlier, and get in invitations to maybe take Filipino language lessons and get invited through these people that I fed whose work that I really love, like getting to talk about Filipino food with Sarah Lupi Burke, who's now the editor in chief of them the excitement of getting to learn about again our culture through the work of these people that do things that are wildly different than mine that than my work is just so again like a version of our generosity i feel proud of all these people to see the type of work they do as radical creators in their own fields and it just makes me feel like we're just out here doing our thing and people like what we do even in in, in categories of like ambient music I'm really nerdy about some I'm just really into music and so ambient music is it's been traditionally like a bunch of dudes that make ambient music one of my favorite artists is a Filipina named Anna Roxanne I'm such a huge fangirl right now she's like inviting me to take a Filipino like online uh, language class and this is through food and creating and being curious these are worlds and industries that I wouldn't get to know about more intimately if if I wasn't cooking Filipino food as connection is what I'm hearing in that. I'm curious also, you know, I know Lagaya, you talked about a salon that you are a part of. I'm curious how being Filipino and Filipino culture has affected that and how maybe it's brought all of you together. It's just an amazing group. I feel very honored to be part of it. And at the same time, it's super casual. <laughs> you know, it has, I'm surrounded by amazing people, you know, like, you know, the OG, Jessica Hagedorn, um, Gina Apostol, uh, just to be in the presence of these amazing minds and to be breaking, uh, well, not, we're not breaking, we're breaking Pandasal with them. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, one of our hostesses is the poet Sarah Gambito. And whenever I give a speech, I try to quote, she has this amazing Amazing poem. I don't know if this is the ending, but it's this fantastic phrase that for me sort of expresses one of the great juxtapositions of Filipino cooking, which is the elemental and the divine. And it's this line, when God was Filipino, he put a pig and fire together and called it porquissimo. <laughs> <laughs> It just makes me so happy every time I say that line. There's a Filipino art gallery downtown now called Silverlands. I just met uh, Chef Pilar Valdez, who is the chef on the Drew Barrymore TV show. So just think about the number of people out there who are are seeing our faces and hearing our stories and learning about our food. I got a DM the other day through Instagram from someone I didn't know who said, you know, my daughter saw for the first time on television somebody who had the name Lagaya. And I know who this was because everybody has texted me that Larry David <laughs> on his show has a housekeeper named Lagaya. But what she said to me, she said, but to see your name in the paper, and she said, 
thank you for not changing your name. I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, that, um, anyway, that really touched me. I think it is so important, you know, to, to be able to put ourselves out there and, um, and so completely. Uh, I watched this film recently that everybody's been telling me to watch called American Fiction. And there's a great line um, in that movie in which the brother says, let them love all of you. And I've been really meditating on that. And what does that mean to let people love all that it is to be Filipino? What does it mean to let them love all of you? I think that the evolution of cooking and representing Filipino food in some ways is the evolution of representing ourselves. How has that journey affected all of you? I know, Angel, you started making primarily not Filipino food, but also food that represented your own culture and heritage as a mixed Chinese person as well. I know, Nicole, you've talked to me, you know, in the in the Ulam times about how um, being able to just say, this is dinner goan, this is not chocolate meat, is in and of itself huge, right? Don't change the name. Lagaya, you just shared, you know, something similar even with your own representation of yourself. How do we let them love all of us? Lagaya mentioned that Filipino food and Filipinos have been in America for eons. And uh, the question then would arise, why now? When I was planning my restaurants, I wanted to approach it like a marketer. And I tasked myself, I said, if I was hired to market Filipino food, how would you do it? And of course, bring out the tools from the advertising days and the psychographics and really delved into it. And when I was studying Filipino food, I would get on a bus, go to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Chicago, San Francisco. I saw a lot of Filipino modern restaurants, Palencia in the Bay Area in the Castro District, for instance, was one that I will never forget. I think maybe the timing was wrong. Timing can be a big factor uh, for success. But the one thing that I observed but no one ever really mentioned, but in connecting the dots I got was there was this desire that I could see, which was how can we be loved by Americans? How can we use euphemisms to get people to eat our food, chocolate meat versus dinagon, whereas the Brits say blood pudding, Spain says morcilla, they say what it is. It was a theme. While I loved American fiction, and I know exactly that line, let them love all of you. I think the question for me in helping get Filipino food to cross over was how do we love ourselves? Growing up, dark skin, habachoy, you name all the different intersections where I were to be self-maligning myself just for existing. Hmm, ah, okay, where does that come from? Where does it come from to be colonized? Where does that innate sense that I'm not good enough come from? And how does that feed into our identity and then our food? Ah, well, then that became the, the stakes. Not even yet, how can we get to be seen, to be loved, to just be ourselves, but the process of just loving ourselves. And that to me was my uh, manifesto. And uh, I think that what we've seen to your previous question, the love of self has come through in love of food. Now, whether we see people as a fashion icon like Dara at Interview Magazine or Paul Pfeiffer and his artwork, we've always been here. But now, my God, we're coming out of the, the shadows, the cupboards where we love ourselves and we're connecting Angel with Lagaya and Chase. I don't know who he might connect with in LA, but we're now, to your point, Ali, loud and proud because we don't have to be in the shadows. Oh my God, I'm dark skin. Oh, but it's too oily. So much kia. That to me, I think was the gift of New York and us waving the flag through our food. It was just a Trojan force. And we're just at the beginning. Angel, I see you're, you're feeling it. You're feeling it. Major snaps. Nicole, I feel like you really hit it on the, on, the, on the head. I feel like my last five to seven years of my life is learning how to love myself. And I think what's what's happened is that, yeah, when there's this huge area of like being proud of my Philippine, I am Filipino, like, like your book, this is everyone getting to know who I am, like, 
all of my interests, sure. But my quest recently has been to love myself. And I feel like I keep talking about this generosity and cooking and sharing. And I, I think that has also been a huge, huge coping mechanism for me to just give, 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 because that's been sort of a survival mechanism to be, to usher in love or to love everybody more than myself at times. And so taking taking care of myself and loving myself has been a big journey. And what happens there is that like, you know, I get to know myself more. I get to bring in more peace in my life. Moving to LA is to center myself for the first time in my life ever. I think part of the journey of learning to love myself was also being so like community minded. And I think that's how everyone knew me, an advocate doing things for queer people, organizing spaces. That's what I've always been known for. And I realized in the last few years that I really just need to take this time to be in solitude and enjoy that. I think about all these writers that I'm friends with and I always imagine them in a really romantic way. Like, oh yeah, they always go to the woods. They write something, they come up with all these good ideas and they share with the world. That has never really been a part of my practice. That doesn't come naturally to me, but I need a place to recharge. I need to enjoy this hermeticism. I think I've only realized the beauty of the words like hermeticism and solitude in a, in a new way because there is self-love there. It is like learning to love being with yourself. I think there was a big turning point. I did my first artist residency in a place that's really, I don't know, it, it really is in the middle of nowhere. There's no one that looks like me. I did a residency in Hancock, New York, which is near the Delaware River, west of Hudson. You know, Hudson is like a mini Brooklyn. So I didn't run into anyone I knew. And I got asked to cook food for the public there two nights a week from just five to nine, which is nothing uh, compared to like running restaurants. And there was a ceramic studio attached to this restaurant and gallery. And I just want, I, I just went there to do some ceramics. And that was actually, you know, this is just a hobby for me. And this isn't about creating things to be consumed or creating things to, you know, sell my work or anything. Um, so to have an experience where I primarily was there to rest, think, be with myself, I was alone a lot, and then have this opportunity to cook for people not like a specific audience that I get that I got to choose. It was a bunch of rural white people that I was kind of scared of. And to share my food, which was Filipino and also food that I'm inspired by from all over the world. Um, and people just love it and love me. It's so significant to cook for people that I was scared of. It. And then they love me with what I make. But I spent so much time being with myself. I just realized that I yearn for that more. And have more time to think about what I want to do and, and how to take care of myself in a new way. That is a way to find love in a different way than just uh, uplifting other people. I'm at this point where that version of loving yourself and loving others, it's a different way of speaking to that. I was just feeling pretty like misty eyed when Nicole shared that bit about how with Filipinos, we aren't, aren't always taught that right away to love ourselves first. I think that's a really good point. And to bring it back to Filipino food, just going to continue throwing it to Nicole. But I remember in your book, you talked about mother sauces. And I thought that was such an interesting idea because when I learned about mother sauces, it was always French, 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 French. And this idea of how do we, um, how do we kind of rest our own narrative away from being defined by uh, cooking narratives that already exist. How do we say what we do is unique and different and good and we don't have to qualify it? I know that it, it comes from, like you had mentioned, colonization. I know that's a major thing that affects still how we see ourselves. How do we basically stand up and say, yes, I am a Filipino. Yes, I love myself. And yes, there are many ways to be Filipino. In some ways, all of us are artists. Even a business person can have an artistry about them. And that means choices. The choice to show up as an entrepreneur, as a chef, as a writer, is already courage. To borrow from James Baldwin, wear the crown. The crown has already been bought and paid for. So just showing up is already an act of self-love. Because the opposite of that is retreat. And yes, to Angel's point, and I have been there as well. There is a time for execution and external existence. It ebbs and flows. There's a time to retreat. All of it 
is a choice. And that itself alone, period, is courage. It's uh, difficult. And just briefly on that note, how, how Filipinos deal with mental health and the coping mechanisms we have inherited. I, I can say for myself, it was very difficult showing up as a woman in this field and having the audacity to not even just get the flack from our own, our own Filipino community. So just show up. What has helped me with self-awareness is when I know I'm being negative or, or acting out of being small, and we all exhibit that as humans. The question for me is, why am I doing that? What part of me is not being loved right now that I have to transfer that to someone else or project that onto another person. And I will make a very strong assumption that a lot of the ways that Filipinos, we have interacted historically through survival, through being shamed, the, the horrific ways we were treated in America through the world's fair. You know, it's a lot of shit to like unpack, you know, the things that I am surprised at, that I am influenced by, that I think are so fleeting or small that are actually quite impactful to me. Me, I can't even imagine the shit that we inherit that we're, we don't even know about. So just sometimes getting up in the day is like good. Showing up for yourself, showing up as you are and just keeping, keeping on. I agree. I think that is an act of self-love. Whenever I meet, especially um, older Filipino women, they all have PhDs. <laughs> you notice this? You meet anyone and you get the full CV, right? That uh, my mom will say, Oh, yes, this person, they did this and this and this. And I think, wow, it's super impressive. And yet there's a part of me that feels like, is this, this we feel like we need to do this. We need to put it all out there. We look at, look at how high we've gone, how much we've achieved, because now you have to take me seriously. And there's a part of me that feels like, well, it's never going to be enough. And at the same time, you know what? We are enough. I would love it if we could get to a point where we don't have to hand over, you know, here are my credentials. We don't have to show our papers. We can just be who we are, move through the world. There's no reason anything should stand in our way. We are enough. We are enough. And with that, I think a perfect close to Quiet Before. Thank you so much. Wow, Nicole, Angel, Lagaya, y'all have made me laugh, y'all made me cry. I really appreciate you taking the time. And thank you, Nancy, for putting this group together. Thanks so much. <laughs>